Good morning, gardening friends. It is 647, July 5th. It's already rather warm. It's in the low 80s. And I'm sitting out on my deck having my first cup of coffee. I did a little bit of work in the yard this week, mostly just maintenance things. But the garden is growing like crazy in this heat. We've been having high 90s, low 100 days for the last week and getting some rain. We had a showers threaten every day, but we get them about every other day now. So everything is lush and green. I don't have to do a lot of watering. Mostly I water what's in pots. The stuff that's in the garden is established enough. This garden is now about 30 years old, over 30 years old. And so the bigger trees and shrubs don't really need water unless it gets extremely dry and we've not had that problem this year. One of the things I did do was trim up this crepe myrtle. You may recall last week it was all bent down and looked like a weeping crepe myrtle due to the weight of the blossoms. And the blossoms were already past their prime, so I went ahead and cut a garbage bag full of spent blossoms. And of course the branches snapped back up again. And uh, I left a few blossoms at the top, just to remember it is a crepe myrtle. And that automatically helped clean up the deck a little. You see it's a little less crowded with bits of uh, spent flowers. They're still on the floor, but not quite as bad as they were. Now, I was sitting out on this deck earlier in the week, as, as I sit over here all the time, and a catbird was making friends with me, he kept coming and landing on this chair, and then on the urn, and just was inquisitive as ever about me, and I'm thinking, oh wow, that bird wants to be my friend. All is well with the world. <laughs> and before I got too big of a head, due to my animal magnetism, I walked away to look at something in the garden and noticed that the catbird wanted the food that was on the floor <laughs> because I saw it stop and cram about four pieces of food in its mouth and then fly away. And I also am feeding a hummingbird that I never see except when the bird feeder is empty. I let the bird feeder go empty earlier this week, and uh, the bird started buzzing the deck. I did clean this area up in here as I trimmed the last side of the camellia arch, uh, and it's a lot more open. We did have to come to terms with a uh, wasp nest that was in my needle palm, that's a needle palm, and I was looking at the base of the needle palm because that's where the needles are, and it's all covered with ferns. So I was being very particular while I was cutting the branches, and I stood up, and next thing you know, I had a wasp that had flown into my eye socket and stung me on the nose. Thank God it didn't sting me in the eyeball, but in any event, it kind of ticked me off a little, but I figured, well, Turned out there was a nest right at eye level, but I wasn't looking at eye level, and I was only about six inches from it, so I couldn't necessarily blame it for stinging me, protecting its nest. So I thought all was well, and then the next day I come out on the deck, and I'm standing where I am now, and one of the wasps buzzed me, and I figured, okay, we can't have that. <laughs> So I went ahead and sprayed for wasps. I don't like to do that because I figured they're here for some reason. Kind of like cockroaches. You don't really know what they're here for, but they must serve some useful purpose. 
I figure they are needed somewhere. They probably just go off to law school, but I digress. <laughs> the hedge is doing extremely well that I cut back now, especially since it's exposed. Uh, it's greening up nicely. Oh, I did want to show you one thing. My Nepenthes, you learn something new all the time. I hadn't realized before that these tentacles, the end of which have the, uh, or will have the uh, pitchers, they use them like grabbers. And you can see here, I left it it wrapped itself around that wire to pick the plant up and then the uh, pitcher developed. So it's basically anchored itself there using its pitchers. I hadn't really ever noticed that before. But the Nepenthes is doing extremely well. In fact, everything is doing really well out here. The only thing that didn't do well is I'm losing one tomato plant that I planted last week, probably due to the hot weather. Oh, there is the catbird now on the uh, hummingbird feeder. You can see he's insistent. <laughs> he's working his way down towards the food. My other pitcher plants, the Saracenias, are looking well. And my new banana, it's doing fine. So yeah, everything, I can't get over how nice and tall these papyrus have gotten, but they are huge. Roses are pretty much done for the season till the cool weather. You'll get a sporadic bloom here and there. I did notice there are some flowers, stalks coming on my hosta. And even though the hosta is in raised pots, you can still see some slug damage. So slugs still happen to get through all of that. And my bananas are absolutely huge. This was big trash pickup this last Friday. I've got a feeling in two more weeks I may lose that particular banana because it is just too close to the crepe myrtle and it's getting caught up in the crepe myrtle. But I have how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven bananas. So we can lose one. It looks like I'm getting some buds on my toad lilies. Grass is looking good. Of course, it's not really grass. I have a biodiverse lawn. <laughs> in other words, whatever grows and looks green, I let come up. Oh, I see some animal was bathing in that last night because that was level when I went to bed. Let's see if Godot was here yesterday or last night. Yeah, he was there. You can tell the telltale signs that water was clear and now it's got sand and stuff in it. So he is still around. And I did clean up this Satsuma clean up in terms of removing some of the lower fruit. I got a good, uh, not a big garbage bag, but a small plastic garbage bag full of satsumas. It's a shame to waste them, but they still have about four more months before they ripen. So it would, and they're going to get heavier as time goes on. So of course what I did is I took them off the bottom branches and it already did snap up enough so that I could get under the tree. And I left the ones on top because the, the lower branches will hopefully prop them up and keep them from bending down too far. Only time will tell, I may have to remove more. I have one errant daylily coming up. It's unusual in this heat to have daylilies come up, but it's happening. I didn't bother removing any fruit from this Satsuma tree. Oh, the other thing I did was I did clean up this camellia in the corner. 
and I freed up my original patch of toad lilies. Uh, there was basically a big black trash bag of leaves and branches and other stuff that came out of that little patch. So it really opened it up. I did notice this particular camellia, for some reason, has set a lot of fruit. They look like little apples or pears. And I cut quite a few off while I was shaping that plant. I have to be careful here where I step because the ground is uneven. There's an inflorescence on my Saranoan Rapunz. Looks like it's fixing to open. He can't, I don't rarely get to see it up close that much. Oh, my other crinum is blooming. This one I've had for probably about 10 years. And I believe this is the second or third flower stalk that I've had in total over those 10 years. It takes forever for a crinum to start to bloom, but once when it does, it will bloom quite well from then on out. I also opened up my little fountain here, got rid of some of the lower branches. I see something was using that water as well because the shells have been rearranged. I can't really begrudge the animals getting that water because they do need water as long as they leave my plants alone. This is the kind of weather, hot and humid, that Spanish moss likes. And that has lived, I bought that last year from the internet from Florida, and this has survived the winter, so apparently I had covered that whole stem of the pindo palm. Oh, while we're here, the fruits are starting to ripen. You can see they are turning orange. I think I saw in the back, if I can get at it very carefully here, stepping in the ferns. Well, nope, something got them. <laughs> there were some ripe ones in the back, but apparently something got them yesterday. They do turn a bright orange. They're starting to turn orange, but they are pulpy and soft when they're actually ripe. But the squirrels do like to eat them as they are. Here are some that got knocked down last night. Right now they're hard, but that gives you an idea of the scale. They are sweet. That's why one of the nicknames for that palm is the uh, jelly palm. I don't care for them, but they are a fruit, and I guess if you had nothing else to eat, that would be delicious. Back in here, all is well. It looks like this uh, coleus likes it there, because I swear it's grown a couple of inches just putting it there. I still have to move the other coleus out of the garage, or possibly I might flip-flop the cuttings I took that are in the garage right now I may put in the front porch and put the bigger one from the front porch into the garage. I mean, out here. <laughs> Something has been eating my coleus. I see a couple of new holes in the coleus leaves. Oh, let me show you the progress. This was the cutting that I took earlier this year of the white angel's trumpet. And it has taken off. It's got about six inches of new growth. And it's still getting eaten, but it's getting eaten less and less. I did fertilize all my palms last week since we had enough rain. And all the palm, I follow the directions on the bag, and the bag directions are basically based upon the height of the trunk. And, uh, I believe it for most things except for my Canary Island date palm because it's as high as these two windmill palms, but it is significantly bigger, wider 
in diameter, and so I put a little more fertilizer on that one palm. So basically I use 30 pounds of fertilizer, spreading it out amongst all the palms in the yard. Palms are heavy feeders, and I do feed them once a quarter. I do need to clean some of these, remove some of these lower leaves so I can walk around this, this Saranoan Rapons. And I think I have fruit somewhere. Yeah, there's a little bit of fruit that is starting to grow. Back in here, the pink angel's trumpet has grown so well that I'm going to remove this particular one stalk because it's too close to the pot. It still leaves four other branches there, so it'll do well. I can't move the pot <laughs> because the pot is on the stump of an old tree. So I will remove one of the branches of the angel's trumpet. I haven't decided if I'm gonna take cuttings yet or not. Sometimes I hem and haul like that and do nothing for weeks on end, and I'm not going to do that over here. I think I will go ahead and take cuttings, or take a cutting at least, and uh, find out where I'm going to put it later. Some new growth on this cycad. It's coming out unusually late this year, but this is its second crop of leaves, which is quite unusual. Back in here, I do love to sit here, especially in the sun, uh, if you can take it and not get swallowed up by mosquitoes. But the smell of the lavender here is fantastic when the sun hits it. I haven't yet gotten at the vines coming over the fence. That's one of those things I will, and my vines going over the fence from this side. I do need to clean that up a little. I was going to show you, but it's gone. <laughs> You have to really go out in your garden every day to see everything, but at the bottom of that vine, trumpet vine, was a beautiful trumpet flower, which I did get to enjoy for a day. Back in here, I haven't decided what I'm going to do with the one that came up in the ground, which means the roots have gone through the bottom of the pot and are now in the ground, which means I can stop fertilizing up there in the pot, but uh, it's doing fine. Left alone, that one little agave will spread and become a humongous plant and it'll put out hundreds of little babies. Whenever you plant an agave in the ground, you don't want to walk around it in flip-flops or barefooted because the needles on the edges are quite nasty. I take hit, uh, hedge trimmers. I take uh, nail trimmers and cut the tips off of these spikes so it's a little less dangerous to back into, but you still get tore up quite a lot from these other spikes there. The other thing nice about agaves is if I dig that little guy up and put him in a small pot, he'll they basically grow to the size of the pot unless they stick their their uh, toes, <laughs> their roots into the ground, and they'll basically stay the same. You could keep it in a pot for 10 years and it'll stay the same size. <clears throat> and then go ahead and put it outside and it'll get huge. In other words, they grow to the size of the pot. Here's another angel's trumpet, the white one, and I'm going to do the same thing, take this bottom branch out. It's just starting to get a little too healthy. I didn't really fertilize these. They have basically just come up in the fertilizer left over that I put out in the spring. I fertilize heavily in the spring for all of the hollies and trees and shrubs that I have, and then I don't fertilize for the rest of the year. I did have to laugh. I was watching one show, gardening show, and they were trimming their hanging baskets. And I remember when they planted the hanging baskets, it's full of uh, annuals. Uh, what's the name? Supertunias. And uh, in any event, when they planted it, they put in all kinds of fertilizers, special fertilizer for the root formation and 
fertilizer in the potting soil and then slow release fertilizer and then they water it once monthly or every other week with uh, soluble fertilizer. And guess what? The pot got huge. In fact, too huge. So they were cutting the super tunias back. And then after they cut everything back, they fertilized yet once again. <laughs> I remember there was an old, what was it, a, a, a fitness show in the 90s. I don't remember the lady's name, uh, but her catchphrase was, Stop the insanity! <laughs> Maybe, you know, if the, you don't want your plants to grow that big in the pot, rather than cutting them back when they're doing what they are apt to do in all that fertilizer, fertilize less. Save yourself the trouble. But I digress. <laughs> Here's a rose hip from my knockout rose. Has really nice yellow rose hips. I don't usually let them come out, but I don't really deadhead these roses. I kind of just let them do their own thing. I could. I do have the time to do it, but I prefer to let them go to hips. You can see those bananas. I came back to show you those. They're doing nicely, finally, rising out of the aspidistra. And uh, Carol, I think it's Carolyn. Yeah, Carolyn Wharton. So far, the horse lovers have not found this patch. Well, yes, they did. I take it back. That leaf over there has been munched, but it just fell backwards in the statue, and you can't see it. I have to remember, don't find the holes. Look at the beautiful colors. <laughs> Enjoy what's there. Still worried about this one palm windmill, but it's still sending up new growth. I may be losing that one. It may have just reached the end of its natural life. Trying to think if there's anything else of note here. Not really. Here you can see where I cleaned up the side of this hedge. I've got a few little things to nip at the top. It really opened this area up in here. And I just walked through the spider web that used to be over here, is now crossing over the sidewalk. I didn't get around to addressing the little trellis on top of this. However, I did cut back the potato vine, figuring I'd just let it bush out. You can see here the angel's trumpet that got doused with house cleaning chemical is recovering nicely. This burn here was not from wet and forget. It was from when I, we cut out the holly, the ivy rather, that was above it. And it just got burned, shocked from the sun. Back in here, again, cut off a lot of the heavy growth of satsumas. I didn't remove any bottom branches. By cutting all the weight off the bottom branches, they popped up and they're supporting the upper branches that are laden with fruit. So for now, I'm going to leave it as is, as I said in the backyard. Uh, I may have to take more off, but we'll wait another month and see what happens. It looks like that quarter line is caught. It's doing nicely. Here's my double rows of Sharon. It has done pitifully in that spot. That I planted that about five years ago. However, it is in such shade that uh, I made it into a standard. That's one of the reasons why it looks a little pitiful, because I cut the bushiness out of it to make it a tree. However, it is growing. It has doubled in height. I'm not saying much, but it has doubled in height. Back in here, the news is the Nandinas that were cut back. This was cut back, what, two weeks ago. 
and it is sprouting up nicely. No, this was cut back three weeks ago and it's coming back nicely. This one was cut two weeks ago and you can see it's sending out new shoots at the top. So it doesn't take long for it to fill out. This one I kind of was sorry I did, but I'll be happy in another week or so as it sprouts up because I get the gorgeous unobstructed view of the haul it off sign. <laughs> However, construction will come to an end eventually. I have no control over it, so I don't worry about it. Or I don't let it bother me. But the Nandinas are looking fantastic. My tree fern is still unfurling. It's formed a nice little trunk. That is my third year for that. Bees are here, working over the flowers of the spiderwort as usual. My bee balm is still blooming. This is the tomato that is probably dying. More than likely it was when I jammed that stake in the ground. Uh, this time I will replant it. I actually bought the tomato that's going to go in its spot. And uh, I will plant around the stake this time and see if that makes a difference. Everything in here is doing. I did notice out front that some more beans have come up. I reseeded. And... Uh, you can see the beans are starting to come up. This side, in fact, is pretty even. This side, the birds and or slugs are still getting at them. However, I have more seeds and I'll just keep popping the seeds in the ground. Air potato is really starting to take over the fence. I have had it on this fence before and the air potato from this side I will of course stop it at the door so that you can actually still use the gate. And I will stop that air potato from crossing over. So I'm going to have some string beans in the front. Yay! <laughs> and then when I take them out, I'll probably go back to snapdragons. Because they seem to last the longest. This little tomato has done better. It's gotten a little bit of new green growth at the top. Sometimes they just dampen off too. It's very possible that was just a bum tomato plant. Let's see. This was a mistake. I read on the tag for marjoram, which is back in here. I thought it was going to get taller. I do like to use marjoram. It's related to oregano. However, it turned out to be a ground cover, so I probably shouldn't have planted this Mexican tarragon in front of it. That is the one thing to keep in mind if your gardening knowledge is just the plant tags uh, that you see on the plants you buy. Keep in mind, they're trying to sell that stuff. <laughs> so they're gonna try and make something sound as positive as possible uh, they don't always tell the truth. It's kind of like, remember being set up on a blind date and you ask about your, what's your date like? And they say, well, she's got a really nice personality. Yeah. Well, plant tags can be that way too. <laughs> We've all been there. My lilies of the Nile didn't get as tall this year as they have in past, but it's still blooming. These bananas have really gotten spectacular. I don't know what the thing is this year because it's probably year number, oh, 10 or 12, it's 10 years plus that they've been in that spot. And I bought just one way back when. And you can see it's got three new shoots coming one, two, and three. Ooh, the mosquitoes are trying to buzz my head what I didn't spray with mosquito repellent. I have one last gardenia. 
blooming. You do have to be careful if you cut gardenias and bring them in the house because they, especially if they grow outside, they're prone to getting little black bugs in them, <clears throat> which is not a problem when they're outside. However, you don't want them running around your house. Oh, speaking of that, <laughs> changing the subject, someone, one of you had sent the fact that you bought a uh, bug hotel. Well, I have found a fantastic bug hotel for inside your house. It's called the Zevo Bug Trap. <laughs> and I saw it. I, I have a friend that comes every couple of weeks to visit. And uh, she was telling me about finding these Zevo traps. And they're relatively inexpensive, 20 bucks. Basically, they're a, a fly trap, uh, like the old-fashioned ones used to hang from a spiral they're just a gooey trap and uh, the nuance of these are that they're next to a night light so the night light is a blue color and it attracts the bugs in any event I put it put it in the house bought it put it in my kitchen and it works like a charm it uh, is surprising it's kind of like when you bought that first vacuum bagless vacuum cleaner and when you're done vacuuming, you look at all the stuff that it's been caught in there and you say, that came from my carpets. Well, it's the kind of same with the Zevo bug trap because you see what you catch overnight and it does work a charm. It, it catches mosquitoes and little gnats. Look at all the fruit coming on this sable miner. I don't know what this is. Oh, it's just the top of it. I did cut back for the last time my cassia and you can see it's sprouting so it'll get a little bit bushier every time you cut it it usually forms two new shoots so you can take a one stem and cut it once and you have two and then cut it again and you should have four so you can get, make a nice bushy plant out of it here you can see the flowers on this purple crepe myrtle they are the same color as the flowers on that crepe myrtle. That one kind of looks spectacular today. My fig tree is now over my head, especially when I step down <laughs> into the flower bed. I've eaten all the figs off of it. They were delicious. It has really done nicely this year. I did try taking a cutting for those of you that have watched me earlier this year, I took a cutting and put it in water. And not all cuttings take to being put in water. Figs are one of them. <laughs> it did nothing but miserably die and lost all its leaves and rotted. So uh, probably next time I take a fig cutting, not that I need another fig tree, I would dip it in rooting hormone and just stick it in some sand or some coarse potting soil and try my luck that way but I would definitely not try starting it in water. That's my go-to method is like the angel's trumpets, put them in water for a couple of weeks till you see roots and then stick them in the ground. Back in here all is well. The azaleas are setting out a new flush of leaves. I fertilized the azaleas in the spring. I fertilized all of this in the spring and haven't fertilized it since. Oh, I see. I can finally show you what a Mexican petunia looks like. The flowers only last for one day, no scent. Uh, they are kind of a weed in zone 8B or 9A. And annoyingly, they were purchased as blue. However, the pink is okay. It matches the pink of the autumn carnation. Encore azalea. I noticed all of the encores have set out growth and are getting flower buds, so they're starting early in the summer. It just barely became summer, so you can't get much earlier than that. I will take a close up just to show you. You may recall that I really hacked back these Laura Petalums, and they have come back nicely. In fact, so much so, I may come and take the hedge trimmers and just zap an inch or so off the top just to stop them from getting long and floppy again and have them thicken out a little more. I have one lone flower 
at the tippy top of that Rose of Sharon. This Rose of Sharon has never been spectacular. I don't know if it's a disease or if it's just too humid here in 9A, but the, uh, oh, I have to blow mosquitoes away from it. The uh, leaves get to looking like the leaves are looking there. They just kind of start withering and keep falling off. However, they do keep flowering. I don't think it's really bred for this heat and humidity, but it hasn't died yet. <laughs> My go-to, it hasn't died yet. Let's see if there was anything else of note out here that happened this last week. I think I pointed out this other crinum is blooming. That is about it for the day. And I guess I will leave you with the parting shot of this old-fashioned crepe myrtle. So I hope you all get to get out in your garden, even in this heat, and enjoy. Until next week, take care.